Hello, everyone, and thank you for being here today. For those of y'all who do not know me, my name is Sarah Goel, and I'm a first year law student in Sapir College and a fellow in the Camera on Campus Fellowship Program. Before we get started, I would like to introduce Camera on Campus and the great work they do in Israel and all over the world. Camera is focused on correcting misinformation spread about Israel in student publications, news outlets, and university classrooms. They provide an apolitical and strictly factual outlet for information about Israel. In addition, the fellowship program in the United States, Israel, and the UK, which grants students the tools needed to write op-eds in addition to planning events such as this one. I would also like to take a moment and say a special thank you to our co-sponsors, Yamina at Ben Gurion University, Kahol Avan at Ben Gurion University, Aim Tiltzu at Sapir College, and stand with us. Before we get started, I would like to draw your attention to the bottom of the screen where you will find the questions and answers button. Please feel free to submit your questions during the event for the following Q&A. I have also listed a glossary of a few terms that may be helpful in the chat. Today, we will be discussing the Israeli borders and settlements and what their status is in accordance with international law. This is a very important topic as there are very many claims made by different BDS groups that discuss the illegal settlements and we're here today to find out how to debunk this claim. Here with us is Professor Eugene Kontorovich, who is a professor at George Mason and Tonin, and Tonin Scalia School of Law and the director of its Center for International Law in the Middle East. Before coming to George Mason, he, had a, he has been a professor at Northwestern University of Law for 11 years, an expert in international and constitutional law, he has published over 30 academic articles in the leading law reviews and peer-reviewed journals. His scholarship has been cited in leading international law cases in the U.S. and abroad. Professor Kondorovich is also the head of the International Law Department at the Kohelet Policy Forum, a Jerusalem-based think tank, and is recognized as one of the world's preeminent experts on international law and the Arab-Israeli conflict. Professor Kantorovich is also plays a leading role in many Israeli related policy matters and is regarded as the intellectual architect of the US state law regarding boycotts of Israel. In his work at Forum Kohelet, he regularly advises senior US and European officials on a variety of diplomatic issues. Thank you again, Professor Kantorovich for being with us. Okay, thank you all for, uh, for joining. Um, and we're here to learn uh, about the question of what international law says um, about Israel's borders. Uh, just to clarify the question, it's not what do international lawyers say about uh, Israel's borders, it's what international law says. And first, I think it's good to, to ask, what is international law? Because um, that's gonna define the question because not everything that sounds like international law is going to be international law. Now, when I teach international law 101, uh, I spend about a month on the question of uh, what is international law, so I'll try to make it uh, very brief. Uh, There's gonna be a crash course. The, in international, international law is the law that governs countries. So law to govern countries has to come from somewhere above countries. And what is above countries? So in the uh, political understanding of international law, there's really nothing above countries. Why? Because there's no God in the, in the theory of international law. Uh, there, and there is no world government. Uh, there's no international legislature. Um, the, the United Nations is not an international legislature. So there's nothing on top other than countries. Countries are the top level. So how can countries make rules that govern them? That govern them? If countries are the top level, how can they be governed by, the, by rules? And the idea of international law is countries become bound by rules if they make those rules for themselves. Because there's no one above countries. Countries are the, countries make the rules that govern themselves. And um, there are two examples of how that can happen. Uh, the, the most fundamental, the most important, the most common one is called is treaties. And treaties are basically contracts, agreements that countries make. 
Because again, a country can only be bound by rules that it has agreed to. No one can make a country follow a certain rules except the country itself by agreeing. So a country could do that by signing a document saying we agree to these rules. And there are many such treaties. Um, also, it is possible that you can skip the written step. And if all the countries in the world agree to certain rules, and it's very clear, and they follow them all the time, and they clearly do this with a sense of uh, legal obligation, this would be called customary international law. And that's harder to show, because you need to show that countries are repeatedly engaged in following certain rules because they see them binding. Uh, so custom used to be more common uh, because it was harder to get together and write treaties. And now with uh, planes, trains, and automobiles, treaties are the dominant form of, of international law. Now, I, I, why do I say this? Because many conversations about Israel's borders and international law could start with, by reciting, would start by reciting a very long list of United Nations resolutions. United Gener Nations General Assembly says that Israel is an occupying power in the West Bank. That means that the West Bank doesn't belong to Israel, that it's occupied Palestinian territory that is outside of Israel's borders. And um, they're written like legal instruments, resolved, finding, we declare. So, and uh, it sounds very um, official. So wh what is the legal status of these, of these things? So again, in international law, something is not a rule unless it comes from state countries themselves. The General Assembly in particular is not a source of international law. And that may be, if you, if you learn nothing else today, that is enough. Why? Because again, with any international law rule, you have to say, why is this binding? What makes this binding? And the General Assembly is just a group of diplomats that meet together and talk at the United Nations. Uh, now, the United Nations is created by a treaty. We do have a treaty. It's called the United Nations Charter, which is a treaty signed by all the countries that joined the United Nations that creates the United Nations. This treaty describes the parts and functioning of the United Nations system, gives them all their powers. So there's going to be a General Assembly, a Security Council. So the United Nations is created by a treaty. And that treaty says what the United Nations can and cannot do. Uh, the General Assembly under this treaty does not have any power to make rules of international law. Why? Because the countries of the world did not want to give um, a body where every country has an equal vote. America, Britain, France, the big powerful countries of the world wouldn't give um, uh, lawmaking power over themselves to an assembly where every, uh, every country has an uh, equal vote. So the General Assembly has only one power under the UN Charter, which is to approve its own budget. It does that very well and very generously, but um, its findings, its resolutions, are not legally binding documents. So in this world of international diplomacy, there are many, many instruments which sound like they're making claims about law, which sound official, but which are not binding sources of international law. And again, uh, that's one, one important methodological point. Uh, let me make another very important methodological point. When we're talking about international law in general, as it applies to Israel, much of the discussion is what I would call inside out. But, uh, what, I, what I mean is it starts with a very particular discussion of what does the UN say about Israel? Or what are the circumstances with Israel? What, what have uh, different international bodies said about Israel? So it starts with the case of Israel. And from that case draws legal conclusions. That is not normally how lawyers work. How does law normally work? What, law is a system of rules and that then get applied to particular facts. So what's that mean? That means rules, like there's a major proposition. So if X, then Y, and you fill in, you fill in the blanks. So the point, there's a general rule that gets applied to particular cases. Law is a system of rules. Law is not judgments about particular cases. That's the application of the law. Okay, so what do I mean? What do I mean? Um, 
Israel occupies the West Bank is not a rule of international law. That's a judgment that would apply a rule of law to achieve legal conclusions. It's itself a legal conclusion. It's not a rule of law. So when we talk about Israel, everyone knows the conclusions already. Right? Israel is an occupying power, occupied Palestinian territory. But what you need to do when you're talking to people on campus is you need to find out what, what are the rules that are being applied? That is to say, imagine we're not talking about Israel. Imagine we're talking about a totally different situation. What rules would you apply to figure out the outcome? And show me other similar cases where those rules were applied to get the outcome. That is to say, does this work anywhere else? Does this work anywhere else? The, um, because if it's just a judgment about Israel, that's not law, that's not rules. That's just deciding a case where you know the identity of the parties. So when people say Israel is an occupying power, I say, can you show me a situation with similar facts that comes out the same way? Now, if they're very clever, they'll say, yes, Gaza. Say, no, 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 show me a situation with, without Israel. And the Sinai, no, but really without Israel at all. Now, um, if you were, and in, in, in comments, I can give you very similar situations where the um, judgment of the international community has come out uh, completely differently. So again, we need to pretend it's not Israel and we need to understand what the general rules are. Okay. So uh, let's say, uh, so Israel was created in 1948. So let's say we did not know that this country was called Israel. Let's say we did not know that uh, any Jews live there. Let's just say we, uh, we know that a country is created in 1948 or any other time. Um, the, a, a basic question when a country is created are what are its borders, when a new country is created. And this is a question that arises fairly often because new countries are created not infrequent. Uh, there are today maybe 130 more countries than there were um, 75 years ago. So uh, the creation of new countries is common, either because of imperial collapse, decolonization, um, sort of a, a national divorce like a Czech Republic and Slovakia, like a, a split, or Ethiopia and Eritrea, um, the uh, federal, federal states coming apart. Uh, so many reasons uh, new countries can be created where no country existed. And what I'm teaching and what I'm telling you now, this is textbook basic international law. Like if Israel wasn't involved, we would stop the conversation in about two minutes. So the basic rule of international law is when a new country is created, you need to figure out its borders because otherwise there will be conflict over the borders with all of its neighbors. Very important to have a clear rule for borders. And there's a rule in international law to determine the borders of new countries. And it is the law, rule that is applied to the borders of every country in the world. It is applied in Africa and Latin America and in, um, and in Asia and in the Middle East. It is the rule that is applied to figure out the borders of Jordan and of Lebanon um, and of Syria. And uh, basically um, it's the rule everywhere uh, with, uh, with, with one exception, but let's, uh, we can call it the rule. Um, and this rule says that when a new country is created, the, um, the borders of that country are the borders of the last top level government unit in the area. That government unit wouldn't be a country because it's a new country, but it was not previously a country. Um, so uh, let me give you an example. Uh, Sarah, how many of our, um, how many of the people in the audience are from uh, the States or where, where are most of the people from? Um, I think it's pretty 50-50. U.S. Israel? Yeah, maybe a little bit of UK in there. Okay. Ah, okay, I'll give a UK example. The, um, so let's say Scotland were to secede from the UK, a possibility that has been entertained. So you'd have a new country, Scotland. What would be the borders of Scotland? What would be the borders? How would you figure them out? Now, would you like think, well, where do Scottish people generally lived or like, um, Where's a place that has like a river or some other convenient border? No, you wouldn't look at any of that. You would say, ah, in the UK, there were component units, England, Wales, Scotland, 
what were the borders of the Scottish part of the United Kingdom. Th that would be the borders of Scotland now. Even if there's some Scots on the other side of the border who want to be part of the new country, even if there's some Englishmen on the uh, inside Scotland who don't want to be part of the country, doesn't matter, that's the borders of Scotland. Why? Because it's a rule that is quick and easy to apply and does not require lots of um, thinking about, uh, which is good because you want a clear rule, otherwise there's going to be debate. And when there's conflict over borders of new countries, uh, then you have war and that is very bad and to be avoided. So it's the borders of the new countries and that consideration, um, ah, oh, such a good question. Um, the, uh, that, that consideration trumps every other consideration. It trumps historical borders, topo top topography. It even trumps considerations of self-determination. Why? Because almost all of these borders, colonial, uh, were not drawn with um, the input of people living there, because that's generally not how borders get drawn. If that all gets thrown into question when a new country is created, it's impossible to have clear borders for new countries. Let me give you one final example, and then I'll answer the um, excellent question of uh, Salome Fuchs. Um, the, where, where does it come from? Because that's a question you should ask. Like, says who? Says who, says who that this is the rule? Um, let me give you an example. So we so um, take Crimea, as Vladimir Putin did in 2014. Uh, the um, the international community regards Crimea as occupied by Russia, that it really belongs to Ukraine. Now, why is that? Is that because the people who is that because what we hear about the Palestinian self determination, that the people who live there are Ukrainians or they want to be part of Ukraine? No. No, it's actually not true. Most of the people who live in Crimea are ethnic Russians, and most of them want to be part of the Russian Federation. They, they want not 90%, like they said, the Russians said in the elections that they held. 90% is just the only number that comes out of Russian ballot machines. So if you win, it's always 90%. But, um, but clearly a majority and the people are in fact ethnically Russian with very little connection to Ukraine. So. How can we say that it should be that it's Ukrainian sovereignty? So the Soviet Union was made up of 16 Soviet socialist republics. That was the top level administrative unit, like the states in America or England and uh, Scotland. And uh, Crimea was part of originally the Russian Soviet Socialist Republic, because it was always part of Russia and the people there are Russian the um mostly uh the in uh the 1950s nikita khrushchev who was the uh general secretary the the head of the soviet union um the redrew the borders to give it to ukraine due to internal domestic political considerations of his own did he ask the crimeans did he ask the russians the ukraine didn't ask anyone but from then on the you Crimea was part of the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic. So on the, when the Soviet Union collapses and now Ukraine becomes a country, Russia becomes a country, what are the borders of Ukraine? The borders of the Ukrainian, so the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic at the last moment of its existence before Ukrainian independence. Even though those borders were drawn completely arbitrarily on the whim of the first, of the, uh, of the first secretary of the uh, Politburo of, uh, of the Soviet Communist Party, uh, like the least reasonable way of drawing any borders. And then when Russia tries to get it back, no, Russia is an occupying power. That is the clear rule. Okay, where did this rule come from? That's an, that's an interesting question. Um, the, the, the rule first emerged in the 19th century uh, during, um, after the collapse of the Spanish Empire in Latin America, which was the first time you saw lots of countries sort of emerge at the same time, right? Lots of um, uh, Brazil, uh, Brazil that's from Portugal, uh, Colombia and um, Venezuela, and uh, lots of countries start popping up, Argentina. Uh, so what are the borders of all these new countries? So the, there were several arbitrations, which is a way countries can agree to um, have their uh, disputes decided by a third party. So their agreement gives that third party the power to decide it. 
And in, in those cases, the decision was made that uh, the borders would be the borders of the Spanish colonial governorships. And even today, when these Latin American countries have border disputes, they look up 16th century Spanish maps to see where the, uh, border, uh, where the border should be. That rule was later adopted in um, international disputes. Now, when I say um, international disputes or court proceedings, unlike a normal court, international courts are only binding when the parties agree. But for when countries would agree to take their disputes to court, for example, there was a, um, a, um, a famous case involving, I believe, um, Congo, a famous case by the International Court of Justice, where they said that this is the, they adopted this as the rule. And since then, it has basically been applied in dispute resolution in every dispute that has come before any kind of international arbitration. This was used to determine the Yugoslav, uh, the borders of the new Yugoslav countries, Ethiopia, um, Eritrea. Um, and at this point it is recognized as customary international law. So this rule is called Uti Potter Dedis Juris. And if you were to open up any book on international law, how to determine the borders of new countries, they would say, this is how. Uh, so totally no dispute that this is how you determine the borders of any new country um, other, than, other than Israel. Uh, and if it wasn't Israel, it would be um, very clear. Um, uh, the, let me give you, a, so I'll go, I can give you some more examples in a minute. The, um, okay, so what were the, um, what were the borders? Uh, what were the, so what were the last prior borders? When Israel becomes a country in 1948, how would you apply this rule? Uh, let me just, let me give you a few more examples just to convince you that this is actually the rule. So take, uh, take for example, um, Lebanon. Lebanon. Um, Lebanon did not like, come down in its current shape uh, you know, from, from, from God. It was a part of a mandate issued by the League of Nations. This may sound familiar, uh, which was given by the French. And the French wanted to do something special. The French are Christians. And so they wanted to create a country uh, for the Christians of um, Arab Christians. And they made its borders so that the Christians would have the majority. And then they added parts to what had previously been a place called um, Mount Lebanon, just a small area around Beirut. They added the Beka Valley, which is uh, the, uh, the hinterland, which was mostly Muslim. So they added on to the territory of this Christian place, an area with a Muslim majority. Now, how did the Muslim, my, 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 a Muslim majority in that area who now become a minority in Lebanon? So how did these Le Muslims who were previously part of Syria, how did they feel about becoming a, a minority in Lebanon? They were unhappy. Uh, very unhappy. And they had many, many arguments and petitions to the League of Nations for partition to split Lebanon again and give the Muslims like a, a Muslim country. So you can have a little Christian country and another little Muslim country. Um, and they had many arguments about why it's unfair for them to be a minority under the Christians. And maybe the arguments were not so bad. Nonetheless, that did not actually happen. And when Lebanon became a country, what were its borders? the borders of the mandate that were drawn by the French, specifically to give a Christian majority and this Muslim minority with some fertile farmland. Now, it has not stayed a Christian country for other reasons, but the borders remain the exact same. Or, for example, uh, take Kurdistan. Why do the Kurds not have a country? It's not because they don't deserve one. It's not because they don't deserve one. It's because there was a Iraq was itself a mandatory territory. Iraq was a mandate called the Mandate for Mesopotamia, also issued by the League of Nations. And that ma mandate had borders. And the Kurds were part of the Mandate for Mesopotamia. And the Kurds went to the League of Nations and they said, we don't want to be part of Iraq. They're Arabs. We're, we're not Arabs, we're something different. Give us our own country. And they thought about it at light length and many people thought it was a good idea. And um, they thought should, maybe they should give it to Turkey, maybe to Iraq. Um, and they thought about it, but in the end, it did not happen by the time Iraq declared independence. And so uh, Kurdistan, northern Iraq, is not, is not a separate country, even though the people there really would very much like it to be and have declared independence and fought for it. So do they deserve a country? Very much maybe. 
um, or probably, but international law is not drawn on the basis of deserve because then everyone would always, would because deserve is not a rule people can agree on. Right? Your deserve is not my deserve and the deserve of the Kurds is not the deserve of the Arabs uh, or of the Turks. They all have a very different view about it. So you need clear rules. So the Kurds may deserve a country, but nobody thinks they have one, and nobody thinks that they get one under, under international law. Yes, it was not like, it was not great for them that they uh, got stuck in with um, Arabs and Persians um, in the in the mandate. But if we rethink everything that like that, every border of the every border in the world has to be constantly redrawn. And international law values stability. Okay, let's apply this to Israel. We can apply. We can just go around the world. You can even try this at home. Mo, you know, it's it's safe. Um, the pick your favorite new country. Um, the and see how it works. The um, we can have a very good time in comments talking about this with uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan, which is a very interesting example. The um, previous to the creation of Israel, what was in that area? the League of Nations mandate for Palestine. So brief history, all of the area of Israel, Judea and Samaria, Syria, Egypt to a certain extent, um, Lebanon, uh, Iraq, all of this was part of the Ottoman Empire from way back when, like a very long time, um, until 1918. Now, when I say it was part of, I didn't, don't mean it's fair. I don't mean it was nice. I don't mean anyone wanted it, like of the people living there. But if you were to ask anyone in 1917, who does this area belong to? They wouldn't say the Jews. They wouldn't say the Arabs. They certainly wouldn't say the Palestinians. They would say it is a part of the Ottoman Turkish Empire. It's part of the uh, so sovereignty of the Ottoman Turks. Now, the Ottoman Empire ceased to exist as a result of their defeat in World War I. And the area uh, came to be um, under British and French administration. And the League of Nations, the League of Nations issued mandates, mandates, which is basically, um, mandates was a system to create new, instead of having the Ottoman Empire imperial territories simply become colonies of Britain and France, to turn them into new independent nation states. Yeah, now, Salome Fuchs might uh, ask, well, where does the League of Nations get the right to make mandates? Good question. Where do, who says they can make mandates? Where does this mandate thing come from? The League of Nations was created by a treaty, just like the United Nations. Again, treaties are the underlying thing. Countries can only be bound by their own agreement, express agreement, agreement. So the League of Nations was created by a treaty, a treaty between pretty much all of the countries of the world and certainly all of the countries involved, Turkey and France and Britain. Uh, and they agreed to give the League of Nations power. Um, they agreed to give the League of Nations power to oversee the um, transition of former Ottoman uh, and German imperial territories into new nation states through this mandatory system. So in other words, country, countries countries that were had this power because they controlled the territory, transferred the power to the League of Nations, they set up the mandate. So there's no question about the legitimacy of the mandate borders. I can prove it. How can I prove that to you? Because on your campuses, oh, okay, so I'll, I'll come full circle in a second. Um, the, so the League of Nations issued a mandate for Palestine. Now, uh, what was this mandate for Palestine? It encompassed the entire area that we would now call Israel, Gaza, Judea, and Samaria, and the entire other side of the Jordan, the Transjordan. Now, there was one paragraph, one sentence of the League of Nations mandate for Palestine that said, if this territory is too large to practically have a Jewish national home on, if it's not convenient, basically if there's not enough Jews for a, a Jewish national home on this whole big territory, the British can split it at the natural boundary of the Jordan River, can divide it, and then basically have an Arab country on the east side, on the Transjordan, on the east bank, and a Jewish one in the uh, in the rest of Palestine. The British did that immediately. And so they created a separate entity. So they created now two entities. One would be called Palestine, which is Israel and Judea and Samaria. And the other on the other side of the Jordan would be called the Transjordan, never existed before, was never a separate political entity until the mandate. And uh, they created the Transjordan. They brought in their friends, the Hashemites, which was a family, um, a Bedouin family to run it 
And thus you got the Hashemite kingdom of Jordan. Now, if you ever look at the uh, map of Jordan on the map, it looks funny. Right? It looks funny. It has this weird arm sticking into um, Iraq called Winston's Hiccup. And on campus, you probably have like these, um, well, people are probably, you know, you probably hear these protests and debates. Why does Jordan have a right to exist? You know, why is Jordan legitimate? Why does Jordan get to have that weird arm that sticks out? No, you never hear that, right? But where, really, why does Jordan have a right to exist? And all of Jordan's existence in international law and its very weird borders stem solely from the mandate from Palestine. And the fact that nobody argues about Jordan's right to exist or that um, nobody argues about Jordan's weird borders, we completely accept the mandate for Palestine as creating the borders of the successor states. Jordan was the successor state of Transjordan. And on the other side of the Jordan, the, the state that uh, was created is Israel. So under the application of international law, as it would work anywhere else in the world, the borders of Israel would be the borders of the mandate for Palestine, which include, of course, all of Judea and Samaria and Gaza. Now you might say, but wait, didn't the United Nations General Assembly vote to split Palestine? Well, we already have at least one answer to that. Yeah, in 1947, in the famous Resolution 181. Indeed, they did, well, the answer is complicated. No, they did not vote to split it. They voted to recommend to split it. If you read the resolution, they don't say we're splitting. Why don't they say they're splitting? Because they knew, they had, they, were, uh, they had read the UN Charter. They knew their own UN Charter, and they knew that the United Nations General Assembly does not have the power to alter any rights in international law, certainly not to redraw the borders of countries. Right? They don't have the power to do anything. They cannot, you know, they can maybe declare like someday, you know, International Day of the Child, but they don't have a real, any real power. And uh, the and so they said, we're recommending. Who are they recommending? To, to the British to make the split. The British thought the split was crazy and did not do it. So what is its status? They don't, didn't have the power to do it if they tried. They didn't try. Oh, sorry. And, it didn't, and it did not, in fact, uh, happen. The rule is not, and the rule for determining the borders of new countries is we go by the last borders as they existed, not the borders that someone suggested at some point. Um, OK. But wait, but Jordan, our friend Jordan, that was just created for this process, and um, Egypt and uh, Syria and Iraq and Saudi Arabia and Lebanon, they all invade Israel in 1948. And Jordan and Egypt managed to occupy some of the territory. And um, they make an armistice agreement with Israel. An armistice agreement is an agreement to stop fighting temporarily, like um, a break in between rounds. Uh, like in boxing, where you go back to your corners. So um, they need to figure out where their corners are. So to do this, an uh, Israeli colonel and a Jordanian colonel sit down in a hotel room, uh, hotel lobby actually, in uh, Rhodes, a Greek island, and they make a map of where their forces are so that they, you know, so that they don't shoot each other um, accidentally. Um, the Israeli colonel had a green marker, thus the green line. So the so-called green line, which you will often hear incorrectly described as the 1967 borders, was simply a map of troop dispositions during a temporary break in the, in the fighting. And this armistice agreement specifically said, these are not borders. Why? Because Israel said, we're not going to give up, up this territory just because Jordan occupied it. We're not giving up on Jerusalem just because Jordan occupied it. We're not giving up on the old city just because Jordan occupied it. And Jordan said, we're also not giving up on conquering the rest of Israel just because we haven't succeeded yet. That was the one thing they could agree on. And then, so the agreement itself says that these are not borders. And this was in, created in 1949. So it's not the 1967 borders because it was not in 1967 and it's not borders because they're not borders. Otherwise the phrase 1967 borders is largely accurate. Uh, so the, this was just an armistice agreement. So when Israel retakes the territory occupied by Jordan, what's the status of this territory when Israel takes it in 1967? Well, the question is what was its status when Jordan took it in 1949? It was not Jordan's. It was territory that had been part of mandatory Palestine and thus territory to which Israel would have a sovereign claim, a superior sovereign, a natural automatic sovereign entitlement. 
So in 1967, Israel was just retaking territory to which it has a sovereign claim. What does this mean? This means Israel is not an occupying power. Israel is not an occupying because you cannot occupy territory um, that is yours or to which you have a sovereign claim. Uh, occupying territory is when you occupy the territory of another country and there is no other country involved. By the way, even if this was even if this was not the case, even if there wasn't, even even if the territory was because by dint of Jordanian administration, Jordanian enough to um, trigger the laws of occupation, uh, the peace treaty of Jordan in 1994 would end any state of occupation because occupation is mere a, a state that can only exist in war. If there is no um, uh, if there was no, uh, if there's no occupation, there is no question about settlements because the whole issue of settlements is um, it's a big involved issue in itself. I think we don't we're not have time for it in itself, but it arises out of certain restrictions that may exist on occupying powers. They don't actually exist on occupying powers; they only exist on Israel, but um, which are said to arise from the laws of occupation. No occupation, no question about settlements. Um, the so the so Israel's now sovereign borders include the West Bank and Gaza. Gaza now may be a different issue because in Israel's withdrawal from Gaza in 2005, it could be construed as having abandoned any sovereign claims. That is not the case for Judea and Samaria. In fact, not only has Israel not abandoned its sovereign claims, it has maintained them. And part, parts of Judea and Samaria were, of course, already put under Israeli law in 1967 under the Jerusalem law, which put the old city of Jerusalem and also some parts of Judea and Samaria um, under, uh, under Israeli law. Uh, and Israel has made clear that it uh, reserves the right to continue this process. Um, okay, uh, that is, so that, that's Israel's borders in a nutshell. Note the basic approach. I don't say, like, let's look and like, uh, what, what did the UN say? What happened in 67? I address those things only by way of addressing counter arguments because you don't start with the facts of Israel. Right? Because if all you know, and this is the problem in international law, people talk about borders in Israel and international law and occupation and settlements. They don't know anything about occupation and settlements. They just want to talk, they know about Israel because that's the case, that the only case they're interested in. And you can draw an infinite number of lines to a point. So if all you know about Israel, you can make any rule match Israel. The test of international law isn't whether you can map, get, get your rule to match one case, it's if it can match the set of cases, the precedents. So the approach is, uh, the methodology is not to start with Israel, but to start, what are the general rules? What are the general rules? Um, if you, you know, say to someone, let, let's say a country, let's say a former Soviet Republic is created, Azerbaijan, how do we determine its borders? That's a good place to uh, begin a, uh, or Iraq is created from the mandate from Mesopotamia. How do we determine its borders? Uh, that's a good place to begin the discussion. Um, Sarah, is this a good time to take questions? Um, yeah, I think so. All right, um, so I have a question here from an anonymous participant. Um, in case, in the case of Israel annexed and disputed territories, what would be the future of the Palestinians, considering that Israel would want to maintain its Jewish and democratic character and also take into account the right to self-determination of the Palestinian people? Okay, lots of, um, okay. Lots of assumptions. There. So first of all, I would not use the word annexation. Annexation is a legal term for when you take territory that belongs to another country and make it yours. So if it doesn't belong to another country, you can't annex it. You can just apply your law there. Uh, so first of all, look, this is not a big mystery because it's already happened, right? It happened in 1967 uh, to Jerusalem and its environs, uh, and the Palestinians are governed by Israel and have the opportunity to get Israeli citizenship, which they largely choose uh, not to, but could. Um, so in this hypothetical situation where Israel would apply its law to uh, Judea and Samaria, uh, it would presumably follow the same model, and Palestinians living there would be uh, have an option for Israeli citizenship, which I suspect they would largely not exercise. Now, 
Israel is not currently discussing, even in like the most um, excited discussions, applying Israeli law to all of Judea and Samaria. They're only talking about applying Israeli law to parts of Judea and Samaria where the population is overwhelmingly Jewish, uh, roughly called Area C. Right? Or, in other words, the areas under the Oslo Accords that were um, kept under Israeli civil rule are actually those areas which have a predominant Jewish population. Now, I believe Israel could actually apply. Now, that does, now what about the rest of um, Judea and Samaria? Now, that does not mean that Israel doesn't have sovereignty over it. That just means Israel is choosing not to govern it. Uh, now, for the, our American friends, um, what's the basic model? Why did we have the American Revolution? Because you can't have taxation without representation, right? No taxation without representation. It is wrong to make rules that govern people's lives, taxes being the rules people consider typically um, most intimate and uh, profound, um, without uh, their consent. That's not a rule of international law, by the way. I mean, look at Jordan and Lebanon and Syria and most of the world. But uh, OK, let's say it's like a principle of democracy, which uh, don't confuse it with the rule of international law. But there's no principle of democracy that you need to let people vote in your country if you don't make the rules for them. So who makes the rules that the Palestinians living under the Palestinian Authority live under? Who makes the taxes? Is it Israel? No. As a matter of fact, Israelis are taxed to support the Palestinians um, and, and not reimbursed for infrastructure and whatnot. Palestinians do not pay a cent of taxes to Israel. Who makes their, um, you know, their other rules, their social rules? Who makes the rules for uh, sour pensions that get paid to ter ter terrorists based on how many Jews they kill? That, that's not a rule made by Israel. Um, you know, who designs their educational curriculum with like the little baby suicide bombers? That's obviously not the Israeli Ministry of Education. Uh, so they govern themselves and Israel's involvement is purely in a security uh, sense to secure Israeli citizens from threats emanating from there. And that would still be the case even if there was a country called Palestine, Israel would still be getting involved there to ensure its own security. And that would not mean that Israel is governing them. So just like America conducts military operations in Pakistan and Afghanistan and you know, rec until recently Sudan, whenever it believes necessary to conduct, to, to, uh, to guarantee the security of Americans, does not mean that America is ruling over the um, Pakistanis. It actually just means America has a security conflict with them. And Israel certainly has a security conflict with um, the, okay. Ah, but one more thing, you said the right of self-determination of, of the Palestinians. So um, I just want to, it's not clear what that means. What, what is the right of self-determination? Everyone has the right of, every people has the right of self-determination. Palestinians definitely have the right of self-determination. Every, every people has the right of self-determination. But what is the right, is the right of self-determination to have your own country? So international law definitely does not say the right of self-determination is the right to have your own country. Why? Because if every people or religion were to have its, you know, the right to self-determination, meaning the right to an independent state, it would be in, uh, American, American viewers may be, um, may be familiar with, uh, there's a satirical newspaper in America, like a humorous newspaper called The Onion. And it had an amazing headline once, Middle East Peace Finally Arrived Through 350 Million State Solution. Every person gets their own country. Um, so uh, obviously, the, so, you know, there would be a 3,000 state solution, at least, um, if the right, uh, and you know, look, the Kurds, they have a right of self-determination. Does that mean they get a country? No. The Catalans, no. The Uyghurs, no. The uh, so the right of self determination does not mean having uh, having your own country. What it generally is taken to mean is having autonomy in your own internal linguistic, cultural, religious matters. And the Palestinians have more of that than any any people on earth, that because they don't just have autonomy; they actually have legislative self governance. Okay, um, so we're going to go to our next question. How can we get the international the international community to recognize the fact that Israel will not be leaving many parts of the West Bank, the same way it is given that Israel will not change its borders in the Golan? Uh, who's that question from? If I'm asked? It says anonymous attendee. Anonymous attendee. Okay. Um, so how do we get um, the international community? Uh, 
Uh, let, let, let's get let's get a majority of the Knesset first. That would be that would be progress. Uh, yeah, start with the Jews. That would be uh, that would be a good a good start. Good place to start. Um, one second. Um, let's go to the questions in the chat. Um, what does it come from that Israel had a sovereign claim over the territory? Because, because yeah, it's a woman. It's exactly right because it was part of the mandate. So the, when a new country is created, you say, well, what was the territorial unit there before? It was the British mandate. And in the British mandate, there was no West Bank. The West Bank is simply how much of the British mandate the Jordanians managed to take over before Israel stopped them. Like if, you know, Israel, if Israel had lost the battle for Jerusalem, then the West Bank would go like be up to Tel Aviv or maybe even further. Um, the, the, there was not a previous thing called the West Bank. So the previous thing was called the mandate. And if you asked anybody in 1948, what is the political entity here? They'd say the mandate and they'd say, what, what's the borders of the man of Palestine from the river to the sea? Okay. Um, I think we have uh, time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, so I, I, know, I saw that you wrote an article recently about the uh, centennial for the San Remo Accords, correct? Um, the yes, the San, the San Re, yes, the San Remo Conference, which was conference. the conference in 1920, at which the League of Nations issued these mandates and issued a mandate for Palestine to be a national home for the Jewish people. Yes. So what you what you mentioned in the in the op-ed that you wrote was about um, uh, how it's important that Israel starts recognizing the date of the San the of San Remo instead mm -hmm. of Kaftet in November. And yeah. I was just wondering why you think that that isn't happening currently. I feel okay, like it would I, be definitely um, in our favor. For the um, for the for the um, non-Israelis, Kaftet in November uh, refers to the date in 1947 um, in which the United Nations General Assembly passed this partition plan. So the question is, why did why did why is there a street named after it um, in the first place? And the reason is the Jews were kind of excited when the United Nations did this because the United Nations were actually voting on um, two different possibilities because uh, it became clear that like the Arabs did not like the creation of a Jewish state uh, as called for by the League of Nations mandate. So they were threatening to overrun the whole thing. So they said, well, look, you know, um, maybe we should like go back on the League of Nations mandate and like tell the Arabs, don't worry, we're like, we're going to be against the Jewish state. So they were considering two options, opposing any Jewish state and saying Jews, We'll like it, let you have something, but like we're going to have to chop it down and not include Jerusalem and um, things like this. So in the end, they chose to chop it, you know, recommend chopping it down and not including Jerusalem, um, as opposed to just saying deals off, you know, we take it back uh, or we recommend taking it back. So that was a big relief to the Jews because uh, in Israel, because it could have been worse. So they were happy. Um, but in fact, uh, in fact, uh, Kafta, but, you know, the United Nations did not create Israel, as people commonly think. The United Nations tried to um, undermine the creation of Israel by trying to, you know, greatly reduce its borders, and um, it did not. And, it did, and, it, and even its endorsement of a, of a tiny Jewish state, not including Jerusalem, did not actually help avoid, you know, the Arab did not give the idea the legitimacy that would prevent an Arab attack. And when the Arab countries did attack, the United Nations uh, responded by imposing an arms embargo to prevent the Jews from defending themselves. So they said, you can have this tiny little state, but then in the end, um, they only prevent, you know, prevented its creation. Whereas the League of Nations really set the basis for the notion of a Jewish national home in Palestine. And, and I'm post, I put up a link to the article if you want to read. Okay, um, we have time for, I think one more question. Um, I think this is a question that's going through pretty much everyone's head at this point. Like it went through my head the first time I heard you speak as well. You make it sound so clear cut. It makes it sound like very 
A plus B equals C. And I just don't understand how we're still dealing with this on college campuses. How, how is this not something that's very common knowledge? Hmm. Um, the, well, uh, that's a psychological question. Um, the, uh, not everybody might like the conclusions that follow from this, uh, uh, from this knowledge. And often people don't want to know what leads to the conclusions that they don't like. By the way, nothing I say is in any way in tension with the idea of a two-state solution. Because Israel could have sovereign rights to all this territory, but still decide to give it up. Right? If you have rights to a territory, it doesn't mean you can keep it. You need to keep it. Uh, you, could, you, you, you could give it up. But um, many people, in order to... Um, when it became clear that Israel, um, so there were sort of several steps. There was, this, there was this idea that Israel should give up land for peace. That was the idea of the, of the 90s, early 90s. Um, I think it became clear that um, peace was not happening. So we don't hear land for peace, right? That's a slogan you don't hear anymore because everyone knows there's not gonna be peace at the end. So the, the narrative began to change to, okay, well, you know what, you're not going to get peace, but that's okay. You still have to get up, give up the land because uh, you stole it. You stole it. Uh, so then you have to give it up. And I think some people believe in the two-state solution enough that they think it's so important to achieve. It's so important that like, we need to encourage Israel to do this by saying that they have to. Now, of course, by saying they have to, they make it actually impossible. Because the Palestinians, why do they? Why have they said no five times in negotiations? Because they say, hey, we read like um, what the two-state solution people say. They say you stole the land. So if you stole it, it's not enough just to give it back. We want interest, right? We want interest. So, you know, refuge, right, right, right of return and things like this. Who said you just give it back? Right. Um, so by telling the Palestinians that this is what their minimum legal entitlement is, I think it's actually made a negotiated peace impossible. Do you think that anti-Semitism plays a part in this as well, or? Many, uh, yes, anti-Semitism plays a part in everything, but it depends on the people, it depends on the audience. Um, no, I can tell you, for example, even after 1967, parts of Mapai, parts of the labor government did not like this argument, so don't make this argument because it will reduce the pressure on us to give away the territory, which is what we want to do. Um, so even amongst, even amongst uh, you know, Israelis, this was, um, people were concerned about the implications of, of um, but this was back in 1967 when the labor folks thought we just won this decisive war, the Arabs are gonna come like, um, you know, asking for like peace the next day because they're going to want some of this territory back and because we beat them so badly and we want to have the opportunity to do that. Uh, you know, so uh, nearly 60 years later, um, you know, we can see that that's not what happened. Okay. Thank you so much for a wonderful okay, discussion. Okay. And, thank, uh, you. thank you. Okay. Take care. Take care.